Hi everyone, we had a great civil dialogue on May 26 on the topic of free speech. Hope you enjoy it. Seema, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us uh, today. This is our 11th civil dialogue so far, uh, including one in which we had uh, Trump supporters and Trump opponents. They were all very civil, so I'm sure you're going to keep to our tradition uh, today. Uh, before we go ahead, I, I just want to recognize somebody who is with us today, who has been my, my partner in creating this uh, dialogue. Uh, Ed Gumbo-Nobi, this is his theater. He had a fantastic season with Jubilee, receiving rave reviews, all kind of awards. Please help me thank uh, Roger. Uh, I also should mention that the previous sessions, you, you find them on, most of them on Arena Stage archives and all of them on YouTube. And uh, I urge you, if you missed the last one, to see it, it was on reform or revolution. And the reason is it was really what I consider a model dialogue. So we had at one end of the, of the dialogue, uh, Professor uh, uh, Butler, uh, African-American professor of Lord Georgetown, who took a very, very strong position that uh, elections will not do it. We need a major, major change in the total social, economic, political structure. And that African-Americans were not that much better off under Obama than they are now, and therefore uh, election are really not the issue. And we had at the other end, uh, Jonathan Cohen, the uh, head of the third way, who argued that the only thing that matters is the next election, getting Trump out of there. And we had in between three people who took intermediary positions, and it was a model uh, uh, dialogue. One other reason I'm telling you that it's not gonna happen today, <laughs> because the issues we have today around free speech are so complicated, so rich, and so nuanced that we probably need at least several more sessions to begin to do justice to them. So let me just flag three, and then it's my turn uh, uh, to listen. So uh, if you look at it from the viewpoint of saving and safeguarding democracy, the attack on the vicious, systematic attack on the free press, the attempt to delegitimize the free press to undermine the fourth estate. If you think about it that way, the only thing you want to talk about is to stand high and strong for the First Amendment, and nothing else uh, should in any way uh, allow to diminish in any way, soften in any way, the uh, 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 protection of the First Amendment. Then if you live on the campus, as I do, you hear some very different voices. You hear young people, you hear minority people, you hear people from the left who argue uh, that free, free speech can harm people, uh, can be very harmful, and we sh should pu put new limits on free speech. And when you think about that uh, a little more, it, it becomes a little less shocking, I must admit. So first of all, if you listen to NPR or public radio, which are very respectable institutions, they have trigger warning. They have trigger warning. There's probably no, every day I hear them saying, uh, the following news may trouble somebody. Well, that's what some of the young people are asking for. Uh, you suddenly discover that hate speech is banned in, mo in many democracies, including uh, Britain and the mother of all democracies. So you suddenly say, well, you know, if they can do it, uh, maybe we can think about it. And above all, I must say, uh, I had a little journey of my own here. Originally, uh, when I came and uh, started studying these things, I was really impressed how far the court were willing to go to protect free speech, including a case which frankly gave me a lot of grief. And the case where uh, when people, parents, buried their ch sons and daughters which were killed in Afghanistan or Iraq, a cult comes and shouts at them and say, you children were killed because you allowed homosexuality into this country. So what is more offensive speech when you bury a child and somebody comes and 
blames you uh, and if God said, that's, that's all, that's fine. That's the price we pay for free speech. But uh, then uh, you, you uh, uh, finally discovered that, you know, this whole idea of free speech, the way we talk about today was invented by the ACLU in 1920. Uh, our founding father didn't have this idea. So uh, I'm exaggerating a little, but it's largely an interpretation. So you ask yourself, why can't I interpret one more time? It's 100 years later, in 2020. Uh, and then you come across something which, if you didn't hear about it before, it's OK. It, it, many, me, not many people didn't hear about TPM. You know what TPM is? No. Uh, time, place, and manner. So the courts say, you can have free speech, but not if you disturb the suburban night slumber. So you, you can go in the middle of the night and there's a loudspeaker in the slot. Oh, no, no. And you certainly cannot play your radio loud in, in the downtown business district. So you ask yourself if you can limit speech. True is that it speaks cause counter neutral. But if you can limit speech in order to people sleep better, maybe we can also limit speech for people who don't feel abused. Well, if that doesn't make it complicated enough, here's the last one. So we have a whole new issue now. And suddenly, over the last two years, we turned to three major tech companies and asked them to become private censors. So we're now asking Facebook, uh, Google, and Twitter to do what the government does not want to do but demands to be done, and that is to remove huge amount of speech, huge amount of speech, the kind which if it was in print, we all would be screamed bloody murder. It's not just violent speech. It's uh, uh, sexually offensive. All kind of speech uh, is being removed by people who have 10 seconds for each speech they make. So if I told you we may not address all these issues tonight, uh, fair warning. So with that, I'm going to go out of the way and I'm listening to a, a wonderful panel we have. It's our tradition to rely on the bios which are in the brochures. And therefore, here we are to turn to you, Mr. Carter. I promise not to. Um, Amitai, thank you very, very much. And it's a pleasure to be here with these wonderful panelists and with all of you who somehow managed to get here today through all of this traffic. I don't know how you did it. Um, Amitai, you know, you, you spoke earlier about a panel where one person at one end had a very firm point of view about something. Someone on the other end had another point of view. I'm going to give you, at this end of the panel, a very firm point of view about freedom of the press. I'm not talking essentially about free speech, although the two are clearly connected. But I want to limit myself to freedom of the press because it's an issue that I have lived with for most of my professional life. I was a teacher for 12 years in there, but for most of my life, I have been a broadcaster. I have been someone who has tried to get the news and present it to the American people as well as I could. For me, uh, freedom of speech is freedom of speech is essential, but to get there, in my judgment, you must have freedom of the press. Three weeks after President Trump was inaugurated, I was asked to do a speech at the Cosmos Club, not too far from here, and it was about the American press since World War II. And I had my speech pretty well written when I got a call on February 17th in the afternoon from a friend of mine who works at the White House. I have very few friends who work at the White House. One of them called and said, Marvin, you're probably going to have to rewrite your speech because the president tonight is going to say that the American press is the enemy of the people. I said, ha, ha. He said, no, I'm serious. That is what he is going to say. I said, using those words, enemy of the people? Yes, that is what he's going to say. Thank you. I hung up and for a moment was in a state of intellectual paralysis. The phrase enemy of the people is not used often. And in the last 100 plus years, it has been used only by a limited number of people. On February 24th of 1956, I happened to have been 
in Moscow as an attache at the U.S. Embassy. And we got word that Khrushchev had called back the entire Politburo and members of the Communist Party to do a major speech. The major speech was the attack on Stalin. It was a turning point in the history of the Soviet Union, and it introduced a time of sort of reform, but it didn't go terribly far. In his speech, denouncing Stalin, one communist attacking another communist. He said that the reason he is attacking Stalin is that Stalin throughout the 1930s used the expression enemy of the people to attack anyone he did not like, anyone who would criticize him. In my line of work in those years as kind of a, a, a guy who thought one day he'd be a reporter, it struck me that that is a dangerous phrase, and I remember doing a good bit of research on it and finding that Hitler liked the phrase, Mussolini liked the phrase. Rarely has it been used in a positive way, but even on, in a play context here, in Enemy of the People, Ibsen wrote about a doctor who took it upon himself to speak to his community. The community turned on him because he had said something they didn't like, and he was damned as an enemy of the people. So I rewrote my speech and led off with what it is that the president is saying tonight and pointing out that the use of that phrase is very dangerous, especially so in a democracy. Because a democracy lives on the ability of certain people to speak truth to power. One of my professors at Columbia many years ago, Dick Neustadt, in his book on the presidency, spoke about the capacity to speak truth to power as a central issue in the functioning of a democracy. You have to have that right. Who has that right? Well, according to the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, the press has that right, and people have a right to free speech as well. So the people who founded the republic knew immediately about the tight relationship of freedom of the press and democracy. The man who hired me at CBS, and as I look around this room, there are a number of people here as old as I and will remember the name Edward R. Murrow. Uh, Murrow uh, hired me in, in June of 57, and at that time, um, he and I had, I was very lucky, and he and I had opportunities to share stories. And one of the sh stories that Murrow told me over and over again was that he went to cover Germany in 1935. He met many Germans at that time, and with some of them established a marvelous relationship. People with whom he went to dinner, people with whom he went to concerts, to theater, people with whom he wanted to share parts of his life. And he enjoyed that very much. And toward the tail end of 1938, he returned to Germany after an event called Kristallnacht and found that some of his best friends, those he had met only three years earlier, were in Nazi uniforms and espousing not the glories of, of freedom and speech and the press, but Hitlerism at its worst, or in their view, at its best. And Murrow was shocked. And we spent many conversations in which he would raise this as if it were an issue he couldn't shake. How was it possible? for a people to turn so dramatically in a period of three years. And the conclusion that he drew was that one, people are, there's the proof, capable of it, and how powerfully important it is that everybody understand the value of a free press. That was one of the first things that Hitler clamped down on. In my early years as a reporter, I remember going to Central America in the 1950s. The first thing that the colonel did when he established 
a new regime in Latin America, was take over the radio station. Why? Because that was the means of communicating with people. So for me, when Trump decided to call the American press the enemy of the people, he was attacking, in my judgment, a foundation of a free press, of freedom, of democracy. I once asked Moreau for his definition of democracy. He used one word, he said freedom. I said, okay, how do you define freedom? He said, think of freedom as a structure, a parallel structure held up by two pillars. One pillar he called the sanctity of the court, justice. And the other he called freedom of the press. If one or the other is attacked, the structure holding up democracy is weakened. And I would maintain that in the past two and a half years, we have seen the structure of American democracy weakened by the action of a president who has been attacking both the press and the sanctity of the court. And I could go on in specifics and give you the areas where I feel we are in specific, where, where we are in real danger. And today, but I will yield to my colleagues now because I've gone on too long. But the danger for me is that without a free press, we are losing one of the foundations of our freedom and one of the pillars of our democracy, and it must be stopped. Thank you so much for including me in this amazing program. I can't tell you how inspiring it is to hear Amitai Etzioni and Marvin Kalb. I'm no spring chicken, but I was uh, in high school when I first started following and learning from both of them. Amitai, I've told you this before, I was a very avid high school debater, and you were one of my best sources. When I had quotes from you, I always won the debates and <laughs> went on to become Minnesota state champion. And uh, from Marvin Kalb, I uh, nurtured my interest in uh, curiosity about the rest of the world and my determination to uh, travel internationally as, as much as I could. It is also very, very moving for me to be here on Memorial Day and to have so many of you turn out on a holiday when you could be attending barbecues. And my personal thanks to the American military among other military heroes and heroines around the world links up very much with the comments we've already heard from Marvin Kalb in particular and the topic, uh, one of the topics of today's discussion, which is hate speech and its connection to hateful, genocidal, fascist policies. Uh, my father was born in Germany in 1922 as what ultimately was classified under the vicious Nuremberg racist laws. He was classified as a Jew of the second degree because his father was Aryan but his mother was Jewish. Uh, because of his uh, a combination of his family background and his political opposition to Hitler, even as a teenager, which makes me very proud. He was put into the Buchenwald forced labor camp, so I cons where he did backbreaking, soul-crushing slave labor together with women and children. He told me stories about this. Uh, so many people died because of the brutal, horrific conditions there. He was not immediately slated to be exterminated, the word that they used to indicate that we were vermin, right? Uh, because when he went in, he was young enough and healthy enough to do this slave labor. But as somebody with such undesirable racial traits and political ideas, he was slated to be sterilized. And one day, 
before he was going to be sterilized, the Buchenwald camp and my father were liberated by the American military. So I get chills every time I think of owing uh, my liberty and my life itself uh, to members of the military, and I am so conscious of the fact that uh, they all, you all, and we may have military veterans here, take an oath or an affirmation to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and so I believe that we are all fighting for the same ideals. Obviously, we have fallen far short of our ideals, and we still fall far short of them, but I think a lot of credit goes into having a nation that is at least founded on those ideals and aspires to reach them and enacts a constitution which, among other things, contains a procedure for amending it. The vast majority of constitutional amendments have brought us closer and closer to the ideals that were set out in the Declaration of Independence, obviously by somebody uh, and by a society that was far away from them in actuality. Now, I believe that the reason I was invited to join this august panel is that for the past two years, I've been evangelizing pretty much nonstop uh, about the uh, themes that are well summarized in the title of a book I wrote that was published last year called Hate why we should resist it with free speech, not censorship. I was driven to write this book at least as much because of my concern about the increase in hateful conduct, hateful rhetoric, hateful violence, not only in this country, but around the world as I was concerned about the attacks on free speech. Because throughout my career, I had seen evidence in this country and around the world throughout my career as an advocate full time for human rights, civil rights, civil liberties, dignity, equality. Uh, my experience had convinced me that all of these concerns, although there might be particular tensions in particular situations that on the whole, they are all mutually reinforcing. And that we cannot achieve true equality, dignity, diversity, inclusivity, societal harmony, individual mental uh, well-being for any of us without also using and protecting robust free speech, not only for the institutional press, which I could not agree more, does play a pivotal structural role, but also for all of us. And Amitai, I'm going to uh, start the disagreement by disagreeing with one specific point that you made, which I'm being very modest, having headed the ACLU for 18 years. I say we do not deserve credit for having brought about free speech, meaningful free speech protection in this country. We were the lawyers, to be sure, but the credit actually goes to the civil rights movement of the mid-20th century. Uh, the United States Supreme Court, under the leadership of Chief Justice Earl Warren, started putting real vigor and meaning into robust protection of free speech in the service of Martin Luther King and other civil rights activists who were being stifled and thwarted at every turn by uh, laws against hate speech, against subversive speech, against speech that might cause violence, against speech that was seen as demeaning, degrading, and so forth. And in the cauldron of the civil rights movement, we have case after case after case that is also a landmark protection for free speech. But now, uh, that aside, I really urge people to look beyond whoever happens to be benefited, the immediate beneficiary of free speech protection in a particular case, because what are being established are principles that will also redound to the benefit of people who are saying exactly the opposite. And what I found when I did the research for my book, and to the best of my ability, 
I was open-minded because I think if somebody had convinced me that censoring, even giving more sensorial power than exists in our system, and it's not trivial, I won't get into those details, but perhaps that will come up in discussion. If somebody convinced me that we needed to go even further to prevent the rise of a Hitler in this country, there's no doubt for me that life would take primacy. I disagree with Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. That's my own experience and that of my father convinces me. We need life in order to enjoy any freedom. But what I found um, in the research that involved the countries around the world that Amitai referred to that do give their governments much more power to suppress speech, even that does not have such a tight and direct and imminent connection uh, to harm as is demanded in our legal system, uh, that those laws have at best been ineffective and at worst counterproductive in fostering the goals of equality, dignity, diversity, and so forth. And what I found was more and more human rights champions in other countries that have these laws opposing them, saying they are doing more harm than good. And not surprisingly, one of the consistent patterns is that those laws are disproportionately used against the very members of racial and other minorities that are hoped to be empowered by the laws. Uh, one, uh, two final points quickly. Uh, one, to Amitai's reference to social media, we see exactly the same patterns in how social media companies are enforcing their inherently, inevitably subjective, vague standards against hate speech. Uh, that problem was well summed up by a chilling headline in a big story in USA Today a couple of weeks ago. You know that sad but true phrase, driving while black? The title of this piece was Facebook while black zucked. And it quoted many African American and other social justice activists, including from the Black Lives Matter movement, constantly having their advocacy for racial justice and against oppression being taken down as hate speech. Uh, my final point is a, is a positive one. As an activist, I am congenitally an optimist, and there is a lot of reason for optimism, starting with all of the people in this room and continuing beyond where we have had just, to me, absolutely thrilling resurgence of activism, especially on the part of very young people, not only on campuses, but even in high school and lower. I've had the privilege, lower in age, I've had the privilege of speaking to young people all over the country, and I have, uh, in, despite all the um, demonizing and stigmatizing that they are too often getting from media who will denounce them as snowflakes and coddled and so forth, uh, I see people who are truly committed to liberty and justice for all, and I think our, our future is in very good hands. Thank you, Nadine. Um, my name is Mike Seidman. Thank you so much for coming here. I, I think actually the difficulty that many of you had getting here is a pretty good example of the pros and cons of free speech, and there are both. Um, so I represent, I'm part of the uh, superannuated wing of this uh, panel, so I'd like to say uh, uh, at the young age, in, in my late 80s, I started to, uh, to follow uh, Amitai and Marvin. I'm now 106. Um, the, <laughs> um, so I, I make my living um, speaking, writing, and arguing. So, of course, I think those are really important rights. They are crucial to me. Um, but one thing I, I do think we have to understand, we live in a very big and complicated country. And uh, for other people who don't have my job, there are rights that they consider equally important or much more important. So. Think about um, the right not to be in pain. 
the right not to be lonely, the right to uh, um, have a uh, roof over your house. Uh, God help me, but there are people in this country, the right uh, uh, to live in a country where gay marriage is not allowed. Uh, people claim those as rights also. Um, and so for me, the hard question is why uh, free speech is any different from those other rights. And m my basic view is that it's not. Um, free speech is important. It has value. Um, but like all the other rights, it also imposes costs. And so what we need to do um, is to think in a serious and critical way about the costs and benefits of speech like anything else. So um, I happen to be in favor of a single payer system and universal health care. I know a lot of people who aren't. Um, and we can have a reasonable debate about it. I, I don't think um, I don't think there's nothing to say on the other side. We can have a reasonable debate about whether to have it. We ought to measure the costs and benefits of it. And I think the same way about speech. And often the costs and benefits will come out in favor of letting people say what they want to say. Um, there are high costs to oppression. But I don't think free speech advocates ought to be able to get away with a slogan and in particular, I don't think they ought to be allowed to shut off free speech about free speech simply by saying, well, the First Amendment's really important and the Constitution guarantees it. That's a way of stopping speech and stopping thought about free speech instead of promoting it. So let me just give an example of how I think that gets in the way of, of clear thought. And here I'm going to take on somebody who I really respect, Marvin Kalb. Um, so let's talk for a moment about freedom of the press. Now, I just want to make my priors clear. I think Donald Trump is an uh, existential threat to the United States. I think virtually everything he does is dangerous and wrong, including uh, the names that he calls the press. But let's just be honest about it for a moment. Uh, we don't have freedom of the press in the United States. Um, if I wanted to go on to Fox News to express my viewpoint, I couldn't do it. I don't have the freedom to go on Fox News. They systematically keep people like me off of Fox News. And the truth of the matter is, um, like it or not, the press in the United States is controlled by a very small number of very, very wealthy people. We're talking about Rupert Mur Murdoch, we're talking about Jeff Bezos, we're talking about the Salzburgs. These are people, nobody elected them, nobody can get them out of office, nobody can control what they do. In my view, the, the New York Times is a national treasure. It would be a disaster if it stopped publishing, but it is really bizarre when you think about it that you have this small family, if they suddenly decided they, instead of running a newspaper, they were uh, interested in buying yachts, the New York Times wouldn't exist anymore. And if they suddenly decided that Donald Trump was right, then um, all of a sudden this major organ would be um, uh, suppressing uh, the views I favor about Donald Trump. So that's not freedom of the press. That is control by an oligopoly. And we ought to recognize that and deal with it. Now, does that mean the government ought to take over all the newspapers? I personally don't think so. But I do think that um, we ought not to, people who believe in things like freedom of press, ought not to be allowed to get away with a slogan and, and a, a kind of unthinking appeal to Patrick Henry and, and uh, John Peter Zinger without thinking about, in, in a very serious way, the way that wealth and power in this country determines who's allowed to talk and who isn't. Um, in the end, we're not going to have freedom of speech or freedom of anything else in a country with the kind of huge wealth gaps that we have in the United States. And so if you want to talk about civil liberties, the place to start is to talk about 
um, uh, redistribution. Um, and it's not about the courts. Um, it's not about Edward R. Murrow. It's about giving enough people in the United States equal access to the means of communication so that we can all really listen to each other. I, I need you for another minute. Can you return the mic to you? He wants you to speak. I, I, I need your help just for one more seven, eight minute. What he wants to do is take the mic away from me. No, 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 I, no, I want you to keep it for a second. Oh, okay. I want you, would you please take it just an extra minute and give you some examples where your cost-benefit analysis established that suppressing speech uh, is beneficial because there's some higher gain can you give us some examples? Well, so here's an example that's near and dear to Nadine's heart. Um, suppose you had in a university a uh, sorority or a fraternity that had never had black members before, and suddenly they have uh, black students there, and some white people on the campus don't like it. And so what they do is all around this, um, in public, public space, and imagine this is a public university, all around it, they put nooses, they put go away with the N-word, uh, they, they form pickets that say, uh, we don't want your kind, so that somebody, every time they go to where they are living, have to pass through that. No violence, nothing like that, just making it really, really unpleasant for the person to live there. I say, um, um, as a pragmatic matter, the cost and balances of that are, no, we shouldn't allow it. And the First okay. Amendment does not allow it, so that's that's okay. a straw person. So, no, so I, yeah, I said earlier that. I, I don't, I'm not yeah, sure you're yeah. right about that. But, well, but, but so, so let me better. let me if I can briefly, as as I alluded to, um, our our First Amendment has been interpreted, I think, correctly as not allowing speech to be suppressed merely because of its content, its odious message, viewpoint, ideas, or content. But if you go beyond the content to the context, our law does say if the speech directly causes certain imminent, serious, specific harm, it can and should be punished. And the court has created a couple subcategories that satisfy these criteria, and Mike is exactly right. Reasonable jurists may disagree about whether those standards are satisfied, but I think this, would, what he described, would constitute uh, at, at least one, if not two, um, satisfy at least one, if not two, such standards. One is what's called pervasive harassment, right? Where it's pervasive and sustained and repeated and targeted, sufficient to deprive the small audience to which it is targeted. So we're not just talking about an idea that a large number of people find offensive, but it specifically deprives them of meaningful equality, typically in the educational or employment sphere. Now, I think that's the standard, in my view, of strong argument can be made that it's satisfied by those facts. Uh, another example is what the law calls a true threat. It uses the adjective through, ag true, again, to distinguish it from the looser way we use the term threat in everyday speech. I feel threatened by the fact that Donald Trump is giving the commencement address and so forth. No, but if the speaker is targeting a specific audience, as Mike described, and intends to instill a reasonable fear that they are going to be subject to harm, which I think the noose, given its historic and ongoing connotation and denotation, in my view, that would constitute a true threat. I'll return to you in, in one second. I, I'm sorry I can't resist. Let me do apologies. It reminds me of a, a joke Bernard Shaw told. And he said he asked a woman if she would sleep with him for a million dollars. And she said, well, I'll think about it. And then he said, how about $5? And he said, who do you think I am? <laughs> and Shaw said, we already established who you are. 
we're just haggling about the price. The reason I mention it, we just established it's okay to limit free speech for certain purposes. We're just haggling where to draw the line. Yeah, so first of all, uh, this is going to get, I'm afraid, too far in the, into the weeds, but I, I, I have, as Nadine knows, I have tremendous respect for her and for her book, which I think is a really intelligent discussion of these problems, but I, I, I think she's just wrong on the law here. So uh, I tried to create um, a hypothetical where there was not a threat. And so we can take the nooses out of it if you think that's a threat. Um, so, I, so give me my hypothetical where they're not threatening anybody. And with regard to harassment, the Supreme Court, for example, has held that um, uh, people at, at funerals of dead servicemen can uh, say just the most offensive possible things that could easily be taken as harassment of those people, the court said that was their free speech right. But look, here's the real point. The real point is maybe that should be allowed, maybe it shouldn't be allowed. Let's talk about that the way we talk about Medicare for all. Yes, and I think Nadine are large, and I are largely in agreement about this. So let's not go down the rabbit hole of whether there's some Supreme Court case that bears on this. Uh, let's certainly not talk about what the framers thought in 1787. Let's not talk about what the words free speech mean. Let's talk about what kind of country we want to live in and how all of us can live together when we disagree about a lot of things. Um, and if, if we have that kind of conversation, Nadine and I can have a reasonable discussion and we might come out agreeing quite a large percentage of the time. But one more second. I just want to say before we move on, I, I would not agree that the rights should be subject to cost-benefit analysis. I, I think uh, rights have a special standing, uh, but that's for, again, for, for the next seminar. But just give, give me one more line about one thing and then you'll get double time because we're delaying you. <laughs> the, uh, you did not want newspapers to be owned. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought I, you were I, going to him. Yeah, he, 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 I, I'm going to make it up to him for delaying him. But I, I'd like you to just take one minute and clarify yes. one more thing. You don't want newspapers to be owned by corporation, not by the government, and not by families. Uh, do, do you want them to be owned by not-for-profit corporations? Or, or where do we go from here? So I. You know, it, it's a good question, and, and I'm going to kind of dodge it because <laughs> I, th I think it's an authentically hard problem, and I haven't um, thought it completely through. I think that um, uh, we might want to have uh, more aggressive use of the uh, um, of antitrust power to go after uh, uh, media monopolies. I'm not. Um, completely opposed to all government regulation of the press. God help me, I think Donald Trump may have a point about our libel laws, which allow the press to go after people in ways um, that are completely unfair and sometimes ruin people's lives. But I, I, I think what I would really like to, well, I want to insist on two points. One is we ought to have a debate about this without just having the words freedom of the press shut it down. And then the second point I want to repeat is, if you're really interested in civil liberties, in serious freedom uh, in the United States, you're never going to have that with the extent of the power and income disparities that exist in this country right now. And that's where our attention ought to go. So of course, of course. Awfully generous of you. And by the way, uh, and I owe you extra because you agreed at the last minute. <laughs> no to worries at step, all. To step I'm in. Happy to be here. So, uh, it's awfully generous. Of course. And thank you all for being here as well. Uh, so I, uh, Professor Kalb started by taking a firm position. Uh, I am I'm not going to take a firm position to be the other end of the spectrum. Um, as the, the representative for the artistic perspective on this, um, I will take a messy, complicated approach to this, because that's what we do. Uh, so I'm the literary manager here at Arena Stage, um, and so uh, I was asked to step in and talk about how, how we think about these ideas, specifically in the case of issues such as uh, cultural appropriation. So when we are looking at 
uh, bringing in a play, bringing in an artist, uh, this is one of the things we have to think about. That is this something that an artist is allowed to do? That they, is this a story they're allowed to tell? And how we think about these things. So I think it's important to, to start by making clear that there is, I'm comfortable you know, saying this is an absolute, there's literally nothing that arena stage as an institution or I as an individual artist can do that restricts somebody else's freedom of speech. That is, that's, that's not a thing that we are capable of doing just as a private artistic institution. Um, it would be great if arena, if theater had that sort of heft in our public discourse that uh, we had that responsibility, but the reality is we don't. Um, you know, in the way that uh, Facebook or Twitter as non-governmental uh, entities, nowadays actually I think it is fair to say that they do bear some responsibility um, that traditionally we've assigned only to the government. Um, arena is not. Facebook. Um, so we can kind of do whatever we want, but these are sort of the principles um, that I at least uh, keep in mind when, when uh, you know, having these conversations. Because even if we're not uh, legally bound to protect others' freedom of speech, that um, as artists, we, we want to be very careful. As an institution, we want to be very deliberate and thoughtful about the art and the artists that we put on our stages, because we do see a responsibility there. Um, so I personally take the position that there is room in all of these conversations, no matter how challenging and uncomfortable they may be, there is room for everybody to speak. Um, I don't believe that um, uh, I, as a straight man, don't have anything to contribute to conversations about gender and sexuality and women's rights. I do think I should probably be quiet and listen a lot, but I think that I can, there's still room for me in that conversation. Similarly. I don't think that uh, only people of color should be allowed to write stories about or engage in conversations around race and the legacy of slavery in this country. I think that all of us are affected by these conversations and all of us have thoughts and are affected by it and should be allowed to say them to other people and should be allowed to write stories about them, absolutely. Um, what's important to me though with that is that there is a responsibility and an imperative to consider your perspective in those conversations. Right, in that I would not uh, write a play claiming to speak for women because I'm I'm not a woman. I can write about some of those same issues from my perspective, um, and that would be okay. But I need to be sure I'm doing it from my perspective. So that's something that I, I definitely look through. Um, but I think the biggest principle that we, the two biggest things, uh, when we're engaging with these issues here at Arena um, and in the larger world of theater, <clears throat> first is. When one of our readers is looking at a play that has been submitted to us for consideration, uh, one of the questions on the report that I have them fill out is, is this play the best of its kind? And there's a couple of things in that. First is simply that, is the play good? Um, you know, uh, Before we came out here, we were talking, and one of the things we were discussing is how, if you're doing a good job of something, right? if a comedian tells a joke that is maybe a little off color, but it's funny, or if a play is maybe a little oh, I'm a little uncomfortable by this, but it's good, we can forgive a lot. Um, so there is that in that question of is the best of its kind. It's simply the assumption that is it, is it a good play. Um, but also, is it the best of its kind, more specifically? That we, sometimes we're in a position of we're looking at two plays that are fairly similar. Um, there was a time last fall where I got a whole lot of plays about police violence. And we can't do more than one of those in a season. We can't do more than one of those really in a couple of seasons, it would be a little strange. And so it is, it's not quite a zero sum game, but there is a certain amount of, there's a limited pool of resources and we have to decide which of these is the best of its kind, which of these is the best play about police violence, which of these is the best play about uh, whatever the issue might be, the new Americana musical about the labor movement, right? Like I've got two of these, which one am I going to do? Which one is better? Um, but that same idea of is it the best of its kind also extends, I think, to the position being taken by the work and the ideas of it and who is writing it. Because it's not only this is a piece of art that we're putting on our stage, it's also this is arena stage saying something in this conversation, right? And we get one shot. Is this the thing we want to say? Is this the thing that everybody needs to hear in this conversation? And part of that absolutely is who is saying it. Um, but I think that, t that ties back to that question of is it the best of its kind. Um, just recently, uh, actually the issue of this, 
police violence looking at two of these plays, and one of them was written by a white man, and it was a very good play. But there was a certain lack of nuance and lack of depth in the way it approached the topic that I think comes from approaching that topic and the way you interact with it as a, a white person versus a person of color. Looking at it next to another play that was written by a man of color, there was more depth, even without looking up who they were when I first read them. Because at first I simply read the plays. And I was like, oh, this play is better. It, it d dives more deeply into this topic and addresses it with the complexity that it has. And then I looked and saw who wrote them. I was like, well, that makes sense to me. Um, so there's a relationship there. But beyond simply the quality, it's also just you want to treat these topics and these communities that you're engaging with with respect and in a spirit of dialogue and in a spirit of listening rather than saying, um, again, it's that question of is this what the, is most needed in this conversation? This is what everybody needs to be hearing right now. And those of us who are members of a, a dominant group, um, whatever that dominant group might be, we have not only dominated these conversations, but we have really defined these conversations for a very long time. And so I think it's actually quite reasonable um, to suggest that we be willing to take a little step back, right? Is, if this is a story that you need to tell, right, then okay, do so with respect and with integrity, but also maybe there's a different story you could tell. Is this the conversation that needs you in it right now, or is, there, is this a different conversation? Because I don't want to say take the position of there should be less art in the world. I'm saying different art. Write the story that you are the best person to tell that story. Um, yeah, I think that's the, I have other notes, but I think that's the most important thing. That's very helpful. So, Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to ask you also to help me but one more minute. So uh, let's look at the situation at Yale. They're doing Halloween. Some white students were putting on uh, kimonos and attire of other cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, is, and all I broke loose is, is terribly offensive cultural appropriation. Do you think uh, they were fla flattering in effect? The other culture or were they assaulting it? How should we deal with the situation like the one we had at Yale? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar specifically with this incident at Yale, but you know, this is a, a problem that occurs throughout our industry and throughout our culture in all sorts of forms, right? We have ranging from uh, uh, uninformed college students throwing uh, poorly thought through themed parties, um, ranging through to professional theater companies putting on shows uh, that are products of a different time uh, and without thinking through the issues of them. Um, you know, this was something that we at Arena actually just recently had to deal with this uh, with our production of Anything Goes this season, which uh, has some fairly uh, old-fashioned attitudes towards Asians and Asian Americans embedded in it. And we have to think through, okay, how do we approach this, this content? Um, and I think that in situations like that, but also in, in throughout, whatever, wherever this issue is arising, um, it's important to think through, uh, again, that issue of, of respect. That should be the guiding principle. And so I suspect that when you, um, right, so respect, but also, uh, thoughtful deliberation. And so I think in the situation you're describing, uh, it's possible that those were their guiding principles. I suspect that it was more about what is the aesthetic that they wanted to reproduce and not a thoughtful and respectful engagement with the culture that they were uh, taking these things from. Can I ask what you did with Anything Goes? You obviously went ahead with the production. Sure, yeah. Um, no, happy to talk about it. Uh, so what we did, um, it was a several-pronged approach, uh, starting with casting. Um, so, so, okay, the, for those who are not familiar with the show, um, it involves, as originally written, there are two Asian-American actors involved in the cast who portray very stereotypical, uh, they are... Uh, Chinese converts who are brought over to America by, with a missionary, um, and they are a running joke throughout the show. They are constantly the butt of the joke. And so uh, our approach started with uh, rethinking the casting for the show uh, to make sure that they were not the only two people of color in the cast, and they were not the only two Asian American actors in the cast. Uh, we saw a range of ethnicities for 
pretty much every single role in the show. Uh, we wound up casting uh, the female romantic lead and her mother were both portrayed by Asian American actors, uh, and there were another one or two beyond the John and Luke that were written to be portrayed that way. Uh, but then that work continued once we got into the rehearsal room. We worked with the, act, the, the, the writers to make a few textual changes as much as they were comfortable doing so. Uh, and we also simply worked with the actors in the rehearsal room to find ways to empower both the actors and the characters. So that instead of making them the butts of the joke, how can we flip these jokes on their heads and make them, they're the ones playing the jokes. They're the ones pulling one over on everybody else instead of being the butt of the joke. So empowering them within the world of the play um, to not be objects of comic ridicule, but instead be the ones who are benefiting. Um, and even sometimes poking fun at uh, everybody else for buying into these stereotypes that they are overtly performing rather than being a true representation. Thank you Thank you, much. that's very helpful, very helpful. Uh, I'm dying to ask you about social media but we're going to, it's high time, we invite the audience to join the conversation. And so if you move that mic over there, and anybody who, who likes to make a comment, if you don't mind using this mic, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, uh, one and a half questions. Um, I'd like to know how important facts are in terms of free speech. Should things be labeled as opinion or when they're distorted or somebody's idea only? Should that be relevant? Um, I guess in that context, a comment about the current Nancy Pelosi's film that's being distributed and not taken down. Thank you. I didn't get that last. The, the last question was, uh, uh, there's a t tape which makes the rounds in which uh, Pelosi is seen as slurring her words. And the question is, uh, if Facebook should have taken it down more quickly, or should have taken it down in the first place? Let me start with an answer and make an effort to, um, facts are essential. Facts are essential. I'm not used to these things, so I have to bear with me. Um, facts, however, are not locked in concrete. Facts can change. It sometimes depends on who's looking at the information on which a fact is based. I have in any number of situations been argued with and denounced that my facts are wrong. I know them to be right. My critic thinks they're wrong. I can't say to the critic, you're dead wrong. I can only support my facts. Lately, in this environment, we're tied up not so much with facts, so much as of the distinction between fact and opinion. Many, many people today believe that when they pick up either the Times or the Post or whatever, that they are on the front page of the paper reading opinion, not fact. I would argue, uh, I am perfectly aware that there are those illustrations. I agree. I also know the culture of a newsroom. And the culture of an American newsroom is to try to find fact that people cannot really have an argument about. But I accept the underlying premise of your question that what is a fact today is not that easy to distinguish. However, in my judgment, it is. I know what a fact is. When I write a book or do a broadcast, <coughs> I'm not going to put something in that isn't a fact without my identifying that. So you help the reader along in that way. What is happening now with the playing around in social media of tapes, it has reached a point where at one extreme, this was something presented to me way back in 1964. It was that early. I could see somebody, a smart, film editor, take film and cut it in such a way that the example that I saw was that the President of the United States at that time, Linda Johnson, said that he thoroughly approved of Nikita Khrushchev's rule in Russia. He never said that. 
but he was able to fiddle around with it in such a way that you could create those sounds. And that's back in 64. Now it has reached a point of such sophistication. It is a true social and political danger. The president did not make up the tape of Speaker Pelosi sounding as if she was drunk or a little wacky. He said she's messy, or she's a mess. But what he did do was to take the tape, whoever did it, and I don't know who did it, and put it out on his tweet machine. Goes to 60 million people. So 60 million people had an opportunity to look at Nancy Pelosi in a way that she isn't. That is playing not just dirty pool. That is getting into a gutter that I did not believe the politicians that I used to cover uh, would ever do. I, I covered a lot of politicians from Dwight Eisenhower on. And somehow or another in the American political environment, ugly as it can become, there appear to be uh, a kind of self-imposed barrier that I can't go beyond that. Now, many of us will remember Senator McCarthy, starting in 1951 until 1954 when he was driven off the stage, so to speak. One of the things that McCarthy was able to do and where journalism becomes a victim not the perpetrator, the victim. McCarthy did a broadcast, not too far away in West Virginia, before a group of Republican women, in which he pulled out of his pocket a piece of paper, and he said, I have proof here of 110 communists who are working at the State Department. There was no proof at all, and there was nothing on that sheet of paper. But there was one reporter on the scene, this now historic issue would never have been reported but for one AP reporter who said it absolutely right. Senator Joseph McCarthy, Republican of Wisconsin, said tonight that 110 people working at the State Department are communists and he showed a piece of paper. It was a straight story, except it was wrong. It was right. He accurately reported it. Then the question comes up, what does a reporter do if in his or her gut what he is reporting is wrong? Now we have seen with Trump <clears throat> a slow uh, and painful shift in the way in which words are used. The word lie, for example, is a loaded word. President Trump today lied. That's an incredibly difficult thing for a reporter to say. And yet you know he lied. You can marry it up. So what happens? The reporter sort of uses the Times, use the word live flat out in 2017, then pull back because it was too hot. And so they use words like misrepresent. Uh, you know, they, they use sort of polite words for lie on an assumption in the editor's mind that the reader will know what we mean. Some reporters have taken it to a point of just saying lie flat out. The White House uses that as an argument to say that reporters are twisting the president's words and saying things that aren't true and that the press has fake news on its conscience. Is there fake news, made up news? Yes. Is most of it fake? No. And I am hung up, and I grant you, on the president's use of the expression enemy of the people. To me, it is frightening. More frightening to me is the fact that there are now polls that say 32% of the American people 
one in three agree with the president that the American press is the enemy of the people. The poll question had never been asked before Trump became president. Now it is asked, and I sit and say to myself, one in three people in this country, most of them I assume are Republicans, but I don't know that, are saying the press is the enemy of the people. 58% of the American people today say they believe, 58%, that when a reporter sits down to write a news story about the president, he does it with the deliberate intent to, to criticize and diminish this particular president. That is not true. But 58% of the American people believe that. I find that terrifying and the, cons the, the way in which democracy, look, democracy is a word. Like any word, it has meaning only if we vest in that word certain meanings, like freedom, like my ability to do what I want to do, period. Now, I know I can't do everything I want to do, but within a society, I sort of know roughly where I am. And if I feel that a government is seeking to curtail my capacity to live in my way, I'm very much a Frank Sinatra fan. I want to do it my way, not Trump's way. I feel I have that right. I put my life on the line for this country. I pay my taxes. And my kids do the same. I'm a good citizen. He has no right to inhibit me in any way. To what extent is that Nancy Pelosi killed free speech? To what extent is that free speech? Do you want me to think? Well, I... Go ahead. Two very quick things. First of all, I, I would never use the words enemy of the people for the reasons you because it has a special resonance. But if you ask me whether Fox News is an enemy, is, is a danger to the Republic, I would say it is. Uh, it just absolutely is. But, but I, I, I also wanted to ask you a question. If, if you think that, um, no. as, and, and I agree with you here, that the doctoring of the Pelosi uh, video is a real danger and something we ought to be concerned about, then why on earth would you say that the press has an absolute First Amendment right to do that. It seems to me what we ought to say is, uh, therefore, uh, if the press does stuff like that, uh, they ought to be regulated and, and ought to be prohibited from doing it. We, we need more people to come in, okay? okay. Uh, just one sentence about facts and fiction, or opinions, I believe Indeed, it's very difficult to draw the line because if a reporter chooses to cover topic A and not topic B, it's already, in effect, an opinion and decided we're not here about B. So there, it's very easy uh, uh, to blur the line between opinion and facts. If you look, uh, if you look the last, the last paragraph, the last quote, is often the one the reporter wants to play up, and it, it, it reflects the reporter opinion. I think the place to draw the line is not be necessarily between opinion and facts, but between facts and lies. Because we can tell, if somebody says that 100,000 audience was larger than a 300,000 audience, that we can deal with. So I think the easier line, at least the clearer line, is between lies, facts, and opinion, I let me fix an opinion. That's just one opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to get back to the issue of the role of social media. Uh, some reference was made earlier tonight. Um, there seems to be a growing view that social media should exercise some authority in restricting who has access and what they say on social media. Um, it, social media is not government, so arguably it's not censorship. But to a large extent, they control the soapbox, and they are the means by which we all communicate most of the time. 
So do we want to have social media with that responsibility? Um, and if they can abuse that responsibility, do we regulate social media in the process of social media censoring what can be spoken? How is that all going to be play out and what are your thoughts about that? These are very difficult questions. I think we could have a whole panel on each of the first two questions. And uh, my first guiding principle for all of these issues is we're not going to find a perfect solution. We have to look for what is the least bad of all of the problematic alternatives, right? Would I rather give power of deciding who gets to speak and what ideas get to be aired to Big Brother or to the bros of Silicon Valley? That's a very difficult choice. As a civil libertarian, I am very skeptical about government regulation. Even well-intended regulations such as the so-called fairness doctrine that the FCC previously enforced have been documented, not surprisingly, to have been manipulated in ways that were favorable to whoever was in power and unfavorable to critics. It's the very same pattern that I described with respect to hate speech laws. Uh, and it's completely predictable that those who have power are going to use this inevitably discretionary subjective power to promote their goals. For government, it will be to suppress dissent, including those who are protesting uh, for more racial justice and gender justice, to use examples of complaints against how the social media have been enforcing their um, so-called standards. Um, for social media, another big concern is just the business bottom line. So we see that uh, for people who are denied platforms, either uh, have their accounts blocked altogether or certain posts taken down, the vast majority don't even have an opportunity to appeal. It's only if they are powerful enough and have enough celebrity that they somehow get access to somebody within the company. Now, the point that you make about for all, and let me just repeat something that's not as well known to uh, many non-lawyers which is that the First Amendment gives us no free speech rights at all vis-a-vis -vis any private sector entity. We have no free speech rights against Fox or the New York Times and also against Facebook and Twitter. Conversely, all of those entities have their own First Amendment free speech rights to make their own decisions about whom they're going to allow on the platform, whom they will not, what messages they will allow, and what they will not. Uh, as a practical matter, however, and I agree with Michael that we have to look, get beyond the abstractions to put real meaning into freedom of speech. In a society where even the United States Supreme Court a couple of years ago said, you know, it used to be debated what is the most important platform for the exchange of ideas. Now it is not debatable at all. It is the online media, and in particular, social media. If we don't have robust opportunity to express unpopular and dissenting and controversial ideas there, we're not going to have it anywhere for all practical purposes. And I've been struggling with this a lot. More importantly, a lot of people who um, think about it full time have been talking about, Michael mentioned one possible approach, which is uh, pro-competition anti-trust uh, 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 approach. You know, certain presidential candidates are advocating this. I happen to be married to a free market economist who's very much in favor of the free marketplace of ideas, and he's quite skeptical about whether uh, the antitrust remedies would actually apply. They quite, it's very much an empirical question of how much power, is there undue market power in a particular segment of the market? And we absolutely have to have debate and discussion and investigation. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion how that's going to come out. So I think what Nadine just said really reveals uh, the weakness of the structure of First Amendment law and indeed of civil liberties law generally. Um, look, 
when Congress makes no law abridging the freedom of speech, that does not mean that no one is abridging the freedom of speech. If Congress is not regulating it, then Mark Zuckerberg is. And, um, or the traditional media, as if, you pointed out. If you ask the question, um, who has more real power to suppress speech in the United States today, the United States Congress or Mark Zuckerberg? I think it's pretty clear the answer is Mark Zuckerberg. But the problem is the First Amendment is an obstacle to getting Mark Zuckerberg to exercise that power in a way that maximizes speech because he has a First Amendment right um, to resist to resist the um, to resist the regulation. This is a zero sum game. It, it's not as if if the government doesn't act, there's perfect freedom. If the government doesn't act, then private actors do. And again, it is worth pointing out. Nobody elected Mark Zuckerberg to anything. Um, he's there because he's rich. Um, if the government regulates Mark Zuckerberg in a way we don't like, we can do something about it. We can, we can vote for a new government. Uh, let me just say, Mark Zuckerberg called for government regulation. Please. Um, I have a question concerning uh, Julia Assange and uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, I believe that uh, a, uh, a free press is the watchdog of a government, and um, all forms of, um, of, uh, of press should be protected as a free speech and uh, everything else to inform the people. However, um, what is your opinions of Julia Assange and WikiLeaks and espionage charges against him? and the extradition from Britain. And the last seven minutes, we need short answers. Short answer. I, um, <laughs> I am appalled by Assange. And I knew the question would come up today. Uh, and I am stuck with an answer because I find myself on his side of the argument. But that is a position imposed upon me by a decision of this Attorney General. And I find that decision on his part to be cunning. I understand now where he comes from and what his point is. Uh, but he has put me, and I'm sure 90% of journalists, in a very, very tough position because we end up being on Assange's side, and I don't like it. Very uncomfortable. Hi, right, first let me apologize if you have answered my question. I don't have my hearing aid in and I missed a few things. <laughs> um, but why now? People have always spoken harsh, cruel things. So my question is, is it what people are saying hate speech? Or is it the fact that the media if there is a difference between media and press, the certain people who are in control of certain media are concerned not about what people are saying, but about how many people are listening to what they're saying that affects their interests. So I'm concerned if you feel that might be an issue. That's how I, I think that's part of it. What do you think? Good question. I, I think these absolutely are perennial issues. Certainly throughout my adult lifetime, they've recycled and recycled and recycled. And to quote one of the founders of the ACLU, he said, no fight for civil liberties ever stays won. And I think in each generation, we have to go through it. I share a little bit of your skepticism. We tend to have historical hubris and say, this is completely new and completely different, and never have we faced these dangers before. Well. We are facing serious dangers, but I think we have a lot of precedents. I think all of the evidence suggests the amount of uh, hate speech and hate violence is on the rise. Uh, I think there are two interrelated reasons for it. Uh, the first is that the President of the United States has legitimated that kind of speech. And the second and deeper concern, I think, is that there is among a section of the populace a growing 
panic about uh, the decline of um, a white majority in the United States and that that is producing um, uh, a massive social dislocation that we have not uh, yet seen the end of. Um, and also just to add, I think it's important to stress that uh, while I agree that um, none of these conversations are groundbreaking, that none of them are new, uh, one thing that is new with this one in particular, I think that uh, the changing media landscape makes a difference. That 50 years ago, if I, won, if I was a angry man sitting at home and I wanted to write about how all of the problems in my life are because of you know one group, I, I could tell 50 people, 100 people, write a letter to the editor in my local paper that they probably wouldn't print. Um, whereas now, I can, in five seconds, I can broadcast that to the world without even taking the time to think about whether it's something I should say or not. Immediately, potentially millions of people can see it. And I think that, that makes a big difference with the spread of that hate speech, exactly what, what part of why it's on the rise. Thank you so much. There is a concept called cat categorical imperative used by Immanuel Kant, categorical imperative. And there's a restaurant in Virginia called the Red Hen. Mm. The staff and the owner refused to deny service to Sarah Sanders, and they used that concept. Your opinion? Two minutes, every one of you gets. Every one gets what? Uh, last word. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, to respond to the question, I suppose um, I need two minutes even just to think about uh, how I feel about this. Yeah, I, um, I think that they had the right not to serve her. Um, yeah, they had the right not to serve her. Um, uh, the, the larger issue, I think, for me is uh, one of, it's important to think through why you are saying what you are saying and what the impacts are. And that, you know, links very much for me. I, I agree fully with your position that we need to think about the cost and benefit. Um, because for everything you say, there are consequences, uh, and you have to think through what those consequences are. The uh, incident at the Red Hen is a um, symptom of a much broader disease. What, in the end, holds the United States together is not the written Constitution. It's not free speech or any of the other constitutional rights that are under glass in um, the National Archives. That does absolutely nothing. Uh, what holds the United States together is a sense that we are all in this together, that this is all of our country, that we will sink and swim together, that we therefore owe a certain respect to people who disagree with us, that uh, people who are in the majority may later be in the minority, and that for that reason, if that reason alone, we have to exercise some restraint. All of that is falling apart. It's breaking down. And we can talk a lot about who's at fault. I have my own views about who's at fault. But the f once you're in an equilibrium like that, it's very, very difficult to um, get out of it. And for that reason, I'm deeply pessimistic about what's going to happen to the United States. And I, I largely agree with what Michael said, as a, certainly as a matter of culture. And I think it should be as a matter of law. Uh, we have uh, many anti-discrimination laws that controversially the Supreme Court pretty much took a pass on in a case that to me is an analogous where the ACLU defended the right of a same-sex couple to be served by a baker who strongly disagreed with their views and their choices uh, and their exercise of their free speech rights and of their uh, other rights, namely to engage in a same-sex relationship and ultimately marriage. Uh, putting aside the question of whether the law on its face extends to diversity of ideas, 
I believe that this, and I share with Michael's view, that e pluribus unum, right? I think that is really the best uh, motto for this country, that out of one, out of many, one, and the many, and the kinds of diversity that we should respect include not only who we are, in terms of demographic factors, but also what we think, what we believe, that uh, we should have liberty and justice for all, regardless of any of those factors, and that should extend even beyond how the government treats us to how we are treated in the public sphere by those who choose to do business in the public sphere by opening restaurants and other places. You can't generally be open to the public and then selectively exclude because of who the person is or what they say or what they believe. Uh, because I know Amate is very eager to keep us to two minutes, I'm going to do two quick book reviews. Book number one. John Meacham's book last year called The Soul of America. Meacham's argument is that we are in a tough place now, but we have been in this kind of tough place many times in the past, and we have always emerged with the soul of America restored. Book number two, book named Fascism by Madeleine Albright. In the course of that book, she describes the origin of fascism in the early part of the 20th century. She describes her own personal experiences with it. She then ends, toward the end of the book, she says, without mentioning Meacham's book, she says she wants very much to believe that the United States of America is so special a place that the idea that the history of Europe from the early part of the 20th century can be transported to the United States in the early part of the 21st century she says she wants so much to believe that is the case, but she doesn't. And that's the way she ends her book. That does not mean that fascism will come to the US because of Trump, not at all. It could very well be that he will be defeated next year and America will only have then to live with Trumpism. But the legacy of this man and the impact that he has had on this country is deep and profound and will be with us for a while, and we ought to think about that. Well, that was absolutely a, very much a discussion I was hoping for. If you go home and think that you don't know all the answers, that things are complicated, then you listened well. Please help me thank the panel for an excellent discussion.